Well, you gave me an easy spot to follow these uh, boring journalists. <laughs> Um, so thank you very much to, to Lardo and to Nick Boras for inviting me here. It's a fantastic conference. Um, so I'm going to start with a mystery. It's about fish. And here we have the cichlid fish of Lake Tanganyika. These are both males. And there's two types of males. There's the tea fish at the bottom and the NT fish at the top. Now, sometimes something quite remarkable happens. Sometimes within the course of 24 hours, Mr. NT turns into Mr. T in every respect. Now, this is quite important because, apart from being more handsome, brightly colored, bigger, um, he's also more aggressive. He's also sexually highly fertile. His gonads are 10 times the size of poor Mr. NT. And he is, um, this, this guy here has a pretty miserable life being submissive vis-a-vis -vis the, the tea fish. But sometimes within 24 hours, something remarkable happens that Mr. N.T. turns in, in every respect, into Mr. T. So that's the mystery I'm leaving you with just now. And I'm not going to give you the answer to that mystery until the end of the talk. <laughs> now, more sex. I want you to, <clears throat> I want you to look at these um, pictures and just see if you can see something in common. Anyone notice anything in common with these four pictures, apart from the fact they're all kissing? Yeah, they're all kissing. OK, their eyes are closed. They're all kissing in one direction. They're all kissing to the right. Now, it turns out, <laughs> it turns out that um, uh, this, this very fine Turkish-German um, biologist actually went to a number of airports about Europe and, and in America as well and counted the direction in which people were kissing <laughs> in airports and found overwhelmingly it was like in the photographs, it was like in Rodin's kiss. They were kissing to the right. Now, it turns out that um, if you have a goalkeepers un uh, under pressure, that is, in the penalty shootout, they're they are losing. You know, the, the other team must get more shots. So that they're, you know, it's all or nothing they dive to the right much more often. If you've ever had a chance to bet on this in the middle of a game, bet to the right, because 71% of the time they will dive to the right. Now, what has this got to do with power, and what has this got to do with the topic of hubris? Well, we heard this morning from um, uh, a very nice talk about uh, a phenomenon we see here. What would you characterize the two children's kind of uh, what, what characterizes their behavior there? Any thoughts about that? <coughs> Sorry, shout out. Yeah. Fear, anything else? Yeah. Fear, and a, fear and fascination. Fear and fascination. Retreat and approach. We heard, about a, we heard about approach and avoidance this morning. And approach and avoidance are the two fundamental biological impulses under underpinning all of our behavior of all animals. It's about survival. We want to approach certain things for food and for sex, and we want to avoid certain things to avoid being eliminated. Now, turns out that, um, and this here, we're back to the kiss here, turns out that the approach system of the brain is more linked to the dopamine system that we heard about in that wonderful talk from John Coates this morning. It's more linked to the dopamine system of the brain, which tends to activate the left frontal area of the brain. Whereas, and here we see in electrophysiology, uh, EEG, you'll see that some people who are being made to think or remember a situation when they had power over someone. So remember being on an interview panel, remember being uh, giving someone an assessment. When you imagine yourself or remember or actually are in a position of power, you activate the brain's approach system. And that's more the left hemisphere of the brain. And when you're kissing your beloved or uh, having sex, you're activating the approach system as well. And actually, your whole brain and body swivels slightly to the right because you're activating the left side of your brain. And the opposite happens when the avoidance system is activated. That when you're in, uh, withdrawing and fearful, you activate the right frontal part of your brain and your body swivels slightly to the left. 
Now, I'm going to give you some simple tips about this because there are some practical implications for all of you in here about how to use this phenomenon, but I'll come back to that later. Now, Mike Tyson, horrifically um, convicted of rape, three years in prison, was the world champion before he, um, before he came out, before he went in. And when he came out, he, uh, he was no longer world champion. Frank Bruno was. So what do you do if you've been eating bad food under fluorescent lights for three years and you're no longer the champion? What's the recipe? Well, Don King, who was the promoter, he had the recipe that American boxing promoters have had for at least 100 years. It's not to do with diet. What Mike Tyson needed was tomato cans. For some reason, I have no idea why, the American boxing fraternity had this concept of the tomato can. What's a tomato can? Well, a tomato can is this chap, for instance, Peter McNeely Jr., a Boston Irishman, who was the first uh, contestee that um, Mike Tyson was set to fight a few in Las Vegas a few months after he got out of prison. A tomato can is someone who you are bound to beat because he's so bad. And this happened. People paid large dollars to see Mike Tyson fight, and it lasted 89 seconds. And uh, the first tomato can was defeated. Here was the second one in Philadelphia a few uh, months later, Buster Mathis. And Buster Mathis, he lasted three rounds, but he was defeated as well. Now, what's this got to do with power and hubris? Well, it's to do with the winner effect. The winner effect we heard about from John Coates this morning, the winner effect is a, a phenomenon that pertains across all of biology. And what it means is, if you win one contest, even against an artificially weakened opponent, or against a tomato can, your chances of winning the next contest against a much stronger opponent are statistically increased. And the American boxing fraternity knew this, but for 100 years, it wasn't, uh, it didn't hit science until 1951, when a mathematical biologist called Landau, who's trying to figure out what went wrong in Europe, in the 30s and 40s with Hitler and Mussolini, tried to work out how pecking orders, how hierarchies in animals developed and were maintained. So he created these, this was all purely mathematical modeling. He created these equations where he put in things like body size, testosterone levels, size of the group, and he could never ever get a stable hierarchy. He got hierarchies, but they always constantly change. Only then he discovered in his second paper there was one variable he could put into the mathematical equation which gave him stable hierarchies. And that was a little rule that said, if you have a contest in the, the chicken coop and you win a contest, you s make a small increase in your chances of winning the next contest. That is the winner effect. It wasn't demonstrated empirically until 1967 in the green sunfish. And if you put a small green sunfish in the same tank as a big green sunfish, then the experience of bullying the little green sunfish gave the big green sunfish a much better chance of becoming dominant when he subsequently went in to another tank with a, a hunk of a green sunfish who was a proper uh, combat competition. So, we know from the wonderful work that John Coates and Joe Herbert did in Cambridge, we know that um, testosterone has to do with winning. In, in his case, winning trades. Uh, you're more likely to, to win a trade, to, 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 to make bigger profit and loss on a day when your testosterone is higher. Now, famously, um, in the 1994 World Cup, Italy were in the final with Brazil. Poor old Roberto Baggio uh, missed the, the penalty, and uh, Italy lost. But a group of very clever researchers were doing the kind of work that John Coates were doing, and they took saliva samples in a group of Italian and Brazilian fans before and after the game. And what they found was, in the fans, the testosterone levels of the Brazilian people went up and of the Italian fans went down. Think about it. We're talking here about the biggest pharmacological experiment ever, ever done. We're talking about mass manipulation of the hormones of 100 million Brazilians and of 60 million Italians. 
So <clears throat> our contest with other people changes our biology fundamentally. We tend to think of our biology changing us, but actually our social relationships constantly, every day, change our biology. Now, let's consider maybe how you might change your biology here. Here we have, um, and I hope there's no ch um, uh, Bayern Munich supporters here, but here was, here was Chelsea unexpectedly beating Bayern Munich. And here we have the classic power pose, victory pose of a, of a winner you see every day in the football. And here we have the classic submission pose. These are primitive uh, signs of, of submission, of, of reducing the space you occupy. Now, if you want to just do it now, maybe those of you in this half of the room <laughs> could adopt the CEO pose. Occupy space, okay? If you could do that, just occupy a bit of space, you know. Imagine the CEO. Those in this half of the room, I want you to adopt the assistant manager uh, <laughs> pose. Occupy as little space as possible. Okay, just hold that for a moment. Um, it's not about males. <laughs> um, but were I to get you to do that for three or four minutes under the guise that I was studying your blood pressure, the effects of um, your posture and blood pressure, I would have, at the end of that, significantly raised your testosterone levels, men and women, measurably. I regret to say, <laughs> I would have re reduced your testosterone levels. Now that's simply by virtue of adopting a posture that's associated with dominance. Why is that? It's because our brains are massively connected to our behavior, our emotions, and our thoughts are embodied. So if we adopt the external trappings of power and dominance, it tricks our brain into thinking we are dominant, and it creates the biochemical correlates of that. So people who are tricked into adopting that pose actually feel bolder, feel less depressed, feel more in charge, and are more likely to be offered a job in, a, in an interview. So we're now on to power. Bertrand Russell wrote a whole book about power. And he said, the fundamental concept in social science is power in the same sense in which energy is a fundamental concept in physics. Now, Karl Marx obviously knew this, but it's something that neuropsychologists like myself have only stumbled upon the fact that we are a group species and that the main determinants, even greater than those of genetics, the main determinants of our cognitive and emotional functions are our relationships with other people. And power is one of the fundamental elements of our relationships with other people. So let me just give you a little quiz for yourself to do in your own head. Can any of you think of a boss in whom power went to his or her head. So just mentally go through whether any of these applied to them. We heard some of these characteristics this morning. Did they change to become more pushy, selfish? Did they like having an impact on underlings? Not just by making them frightened or shocking them, but also making them grateful. Did they start to see people as objects in terms of how useful they are? Did they develop a tunnel vision? Did they become sexually primed? <coughs> Hypocritical? Difficulty in seeing things from other people's points of view? Disinhibited? Would-be jokey comments are not funny to the person who's getting them? Or incompetent and bullying? Now, this last one's very important because the evidence is from Nathaniel Fast. If you promote someone into a position in which they feel in inadequate and they have power, they're very, very likely to end up bullying. That's a horribly toxic combination of inadequacy and, and power. And if we believe the Peter principle, we're all promoted to the level of our own incompetence, so we're all inadequate. And so if we're given power, we're all prone to bullying. Now, the thing about these uh, characteristics here is, and we heard about some of them this morning, there's some fantastic social psychology researchers, not including myself, I don't do that particular kind of research, in, uh, in, in Britain, Anna Guinotti, in Holland, Pamela Smith, and in America, Adam Galinsky, who have systematically shown that even tiny manipulations of the amount of power that you represent in your own brain 
can shift your behavior in all of these ways. We heard about the biscuit study this morning, the crumbs and the taking the last biscuit. By the way, the women did it just as much as the men in that, in that particular study. But all of these are if measured and demonstrated effects of power. The usual manipulation is either making someone boss in a little experiment where you have to evaluate the other person or uh, getting people to remember times when they were either powerful or powerless. So power has, makes us into not very nice people, it seems, bullies and selfish and seeing other people as objects. What about these? Can you think of bosses who have shown these characteristics? Strategic vision, decisive, goal-focused, healthy appetite for risk, handled stress well, smart, upbeat, bold and inspiring. Because these are also effects of power on the brain. The present Irish Prime Minister, Enda Kenny, was a disaster as leader of the opposition. They tried to get rid of him of nine months before he became... But he's ended up as a respected Euro European leader who's done a remarkable job in getting the country back onto its economic feet. He is someone who was made smarter by power, I would argue. So how can that be? How can you have this two-edged sword of power? It can make people selfish and hypocritical, or it can make them smart and abstract thinking. Well, the evidence is that, like many of the brain's other chemical messengers, neurotransmitters, there's an inverted U-shape function. Too little and your brain underperforms, and too much and your brain function is disrupted. And so there's this delicate balance. How do you get people in power who can hit this Goldilocks zone and get all the benefits of power because power is an antidepressant. Power emboldens you. Power allows you to see the, the wood rather than the trees. Power helps you have charisma. It doesn't guarantee charisma, but it helps you have, char have charisma because what a charismatic person has is the capacity to see a, a future alignment of events that other people cannot see. And power actually is a drug which helps your brain do that. We know from Lord Owen's uh, fundamental work about leaders who develop the hubris syndrome. Um, We'll be hearing about this, and we've heard about this, uh, uh, that, that there's an, a manner of speaking, a, a, a change in behavior, a compl complete change in behavior that happens to people. We have heard about Lady Thatcher. And um, I just want to just maybe just have a quick uh, sample of this um, interview here. I hope the sound, do you think the sound's on? I hope so. In the end, there is a judgment that, well, I think if you... If you have faith about these things, then you realise that judgment is made by other people. Um, so, sorry, and also it, by... What, what um, do you mean by that? Sorry. I mean, by the people, by... If you believe in, in God, it's made by God as well. So, um, George Bush told the Fatah leader that, he believed, that God had told him to invade Iraq. And um, Tony Blair clearly there felt that there was a greater power, that he was... So in some way anointed in terms of his decisions, the weighty decisions he had to make. This is a, this is a feature of hubris. The, 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 one of the symptoms is messianic manner, but the thing about power is you, you, it, it's, it, the, the real victim of power is the ego. And if the ego swells to that extent, it becomes so hungry that it cannot bear to think of itself as being secondary or subservient to higher laws or principles or people. So it's a very common thing. Julius Caesar had himself made a demigod while he was still alive. Um, the, uh, you, you, many millionaires, J. Paul Getty, regarded himself as, believed himself to be the reincarnation of the Emperor Hadrian. It's a feature. Picasso had himself called uh, the son by his staff. He called himself the king. So there's this sense of specialness that comes from this narcissistically swollen ego uh, that is the greatest... Um, risk of power. So um, can we forecast, can we tell who's going to succumb to it? So I'm going to finish off with uh, trying to give you some tips about that. By the way, if any of you want to benefit from the, the left-right brain side of things, the men among you, if you want to feel more in charge and more powerful, clench your, lightly clench your right hand for about three or four minutes. That will activate the left side of your brain and will make you feel more in charge. 
That hasn't been shown with women, but women, if you adopt a power posture, you will raise testosterone levels, increase dopamine levels, you'll feel more in charge. So before an interview, that's a good tip. Anyway, that's my only <laughs> practical tip here. So can we tell who will succumb to hubris? Well, there's a, f a fantastic piece of research, a lot of research done by the great psychologist David McClellan from Harvard University and subsequently by David Winter in uh, Michigan. And they identified one of the three great, and we heard this from Adrian Furnham this morning, one of the three great motivators of human beings is that we vary in the amount to which we're motivated to have power over other people. And it's all of it, at the base of this, there's always a personal egotistical aspect to this, the sheer pleasure of being in charge, of calling the shots. Now, you can assess how much motivation people have for power by their, their free speech and their natural language. This was done on Tony Blair's, uh, for instance, he was assessed, his power motivation was assessed using his prime minister questions answers by a guy called Dyson. And this is what you're looking for in the free text. Themes of carrying out strong psychologically or physically forceful actions. I won't read these out. I'll just let you read them. So you can, you can reliably code this in free speech and give people a score on how much power motivation they have. And um, that has strong biological effects, that if you have high power motivation and you are upset in a contest with someone, you will get a huge surge of testosterone if you win that contest and a huge surge of cortisol, the stress hormone, if you lose it. If you have a low power motivation, on the other hand, you will get a high surge of cortisol if you win. Schultheis has shown that. So some people don't have the motivation for power, and actually dominating someone else is stressful for them. And this is largely unconscious. However, there's a second dimension to power motivation, which is where you want to have control over other things, but you want it for the benefit of the group, not just egotistically. There is always some P power, egotistical power in power motivation, but people vary in how much S power they uh, have. And the S power can be measured in the speech by, reliably by the extent to which people use not, don't, and shouldn't. And that's a sign of internal constraints on behavior. And if you compare, um, as was done, uh, George Bush and uh, Barack Obama on their power motivation, both have equally high appetites for power, but George Bush is very low in the S power, while Barack Obama is high on the S power. Why is that important? Because S power acts as an antidote to the testosterone, addictive testosterone surges of power. So you get less, smaller and less sustained testosterone surges to dominating other people if you have a combination of P power and S power. The interesting thing is, women have average higher levels of S power than men, and therefore are somewhat protected against the hubris syndrome to some extent, certainly not completely as we heard earlier on today. So I'm back at the fish. Why does Mr. NT turn into Mr. T in every respect? Well, here's the answer. One of the downsides of being a tea fish is you're brightly colored. In the shallow waters of Lake Tanganyika, you're therefore more visible to gulls and more likely to be taken out of the water. Now, the reason you're called a tea fish is because you have territory. When you're plucked out of the water, your territory becomes vacant. So an NT fish sees the territory by merely having territory is biologically, in every respect, transformed. The gonads grow to 10 times the size within a week and their color, size, everything has changed. So that's the influence of environment on, over biology. Now, it doesn't happen in humans, does it? <laughs> Oscar winners live on average four years longer than Oscar nominees. <laughs> four years is the increase in lifespan you would get if you cured all cancers. Nobel Prize winners live on average one and a half years longer than Nobel nominees. So it does happen in humans. Our power relationships are the fundamental dictators of who we are, including the very stuff of our brains. 
So we have to, can't ignore culture here. So my, my book has been translated maybe into a dozen languages or something. And, and so there's the American one, there's the Dutch one, there's the, uh, the, the cute British one, and here's the, the German one. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.